What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are covering three unbelievable cases of missing people found in secret rooms. Let's get right into it. Number three, Joanne Nichols. Joanne Nichols was described by those around her as a gentle and kind woman, a first grade teacher in Poughkeepsie, New York. Deeply religious, she grew up in Louisiana with big dreams, hoping to one day become an actress. In the end, she earned her Master's of Education in 1955, teaching in a Mississippi Delta town, the same town that would later introduce her to her future husband. James Nichols was born into a beloved family. His father had served in World War I as a medic before becoming the physician for the village he was raised in. At one stage, boasting a population of just over 1,000, it was a quiet place to grow up, and his father was remembered fondly by many of the residents. When his first wife died, however, he married a stylish woman that hid many secrets. Those that remember the family speak of how they weren't affectionate, James in particular only ever showing affection towards the cats they saw. He was described as both intelligent and strange in equal measure, avoided by the children of the village. Like Joanne, he had a love for education, majoring in it before graduating with two degrees. Meeting while she was teaching in another of the Mississippi Delta towns, they quickly married in Louisiana and eventually moved to Missouri. Here, they welcomed a son, naming him after his father, before uprooting their lives once more and moving to Poughkeepsie. All was well for 11 years, Joanne teaching first grade and their son eventually following in James's footsteps by majoring in education. When he graduated in 1980, all should have been well, but tragedy struck in 1982 while their son studied for a computer science degree. Falling off an amphibious car, he drowned in Sardis Lake, something that left the couple grieving their only child. James seemed to want to free himself of any and all reminders of what could have been, selling the property he kept for his son. However, tension arose in the marriage when he kept the amphibious car in their garden, something that angered Joanne. Despite the grief that came with losing her son, she continued to teach and outwardly seemed like the same woman everybody knew and loved. She still doted on her students, southern charm intact, making them feel like stars despite her personal struggles. At home, she struggled to move through the house, her husband hoarding clutter that had spiraled out of control. Only a few weeks before she disappeared, she discovered the carcass of their pet cat as she went through the freezer, refusing to cook out of horror and disgust. On December 20th, 1985, all seemed well. She taught her students, went out to dinner with her husband and a few friends, with a hair appointment planned for the morning. When she didn't show up for her appointment, detectives quickly got involved, her husband involving himself from the very start. He was the one that directed them to a note on their computer describing her depression over losing their son. He was the one that found her car, washing and vacuuming it before it was handed to detectives. He was also the one that reported a call from her on Christmas Eve to reassure him and tell him to say hello to their dogs. Her mother was suspicious. Every Sunday, Joanne would call her, usually in the early afternoon, those calls stopping the second she disappeared. She struggled to understand her behavior, and those that knew the couple felt the same. Each revelation by James bringing them more questions than answers. Where he told newspapers he had no idea of where she was, whether she was alive or dead. He told detectives she had assumed a new identity and told him not to search for her. Weeks after Joanne had disappeared, 
James had started to date another woman. A year after her disappearance, he filed for divorce. Unable to get a search warrant, detectives were left with nothing but questions for almost 30 years. When James passed away around Christmas in 2012, contractors had to be hired to clean the house before it could be sold. The freezer held their two pet dogs, house filled with decaying books and piles of gadgets that had fallen to the wayside as life went on. Perhaps the most concerning discovery was that of a hollow-sounding wall in the basement, pulled down to reveal a barrel. Inside of that barrel, there was a black bag, tightly bound with a rope, that held skeletal remains. Dental records identified the woman as Joanne. Skull showing blunt force trauma had killed her years earlier. To neighbors, this confirmed what they always knew. Joanne had never run away. Instead, she had been left to decay like the clutter filling their house. Her husband had taken her life, lying to grieving friends and family for years, taking all of the answers to the grave. Number 2. Katie Beers December 28, 1992 Katie Beers is only two days away from her 10th birthday, but she isn't excited about it. In her life, she's experienced at the hands of those that were supposed to protect her. The only person she trusts is her family friend, John Esposito, the man that takes her and her brother to toy shops, arcades, and even lets them play at his house. He gives them gifts, acts as a confidant, and provides an escape from her troubled home life. Underneath that friendly exterior lay something sinister. Esposito tried to convince Katie to leave her grandmother's house to meet him many times, sweetening the deal with promises of ice cream and sweets. Too afraid to break the rules, she never gave in, but it made her suspicious. Esposito had visited on the 28th, buying her a dollhouse and promising to return to assemble it later. When he did show up, he asked her godmother if he could take her to the arcade, and Katie's nightmare began. He took her to a toy store, buying a game she could only play at his home. Taking her there, and into a room filled with everything a child could want. Games and sugary treats. But instead of playing her new game, a nightmare began. When he then took her to his office, she tried to call 911, but was caught. Phone grabbed from her hands as she was thrown into a nearby closet. Using a pulling mechanism, he began to pull up a slab of concrete, revealing a dark tunnel underneath the floor, one that he demanded Katie go down. When she refused, he dropped her down without hesitation, forcing her to crawl through the darkness and towards a cramped room. The room would become Katie's prison for the next 17 days. In this time, Esposito would come down once a day to feed her, her only companion, a television. Surrounded by yellow soundproofing material, a few days in, she was forced to record a message for her godmother. In it, she says she's been kidnapped by a man with a knife, terrified of what may come next. This message was later played over a payphone to her, before he reported her missing at the arcade they were supposed to visit, hoping to create an alibi for himself. His plan failed, however, and detectives quickly turned their attention to him. Looking at his past, they discovered he'd previously attempted to abduct a seven-year-old, leading to him becoming their main suspect. Still, Katie was resilient, finding a loose key one day and tucking it beneath a pillow. This key allowed her to unlock the chain around her neck, the same chain that she'd locked back up as she'd found it when she heard somebody coming down. For her 10th birthday, she sang happy birthday to herself, 
something caught on the cameras in the bunker. She heard footsteps above her and screamed at the police in the hopes of being found, only to earn more punishment. But the persistence of authorities kept Esposito away from her for longer and longer, giving her time to come up with a plan. On the 14th day, she told Esposito she didn't feel well, something that concerned him. In the time she'd spent in the bunker, he'd expressed a peculiar love for her instead of a desire to kill her. So, when faced with the possibility of her dying in his care, he began to worry. Three days later, after speaking to his attorneys, John Esposito came clean. With authorities close to cracking the case and Katie falling ill, he confessed to knowing where she was the entire time. The 200-pound concrete slab was lifted by his pulley mechanism, revealing the hole beneath it. In the years since her rescue, Katie has spoken of the conflicted feeling she had when she heard voices. Esposito never came down so early in the day, and she was worried that the voices were friends of his. She didn't believe him when they told her they were the police, but still rushed through the tunnel. After 17 days of captivity in a tiny bunker, Katie Beers was free again. She was quickly sent to live with a foster family, something that finally freed her from the she experienced at home as well. Though the situation was terrible, she says it saved her life, and detectives knew from the beginning that she was a survivor. Esposito was sentenced to 15 years to life, serving almost 20 years before dying after a parole hearing. In the years that followed her abduction, Katie was protected from the media and allowed to live a normal life. And with the help of extensive therapy and a supportive foster family, she went on to publish a book detailing her ordeal. These days, she lives a quiet life with her own family, giving motivational speeches based on her experiences and helping other missing children. Number 1. Richard Chikevda Richard Chikevda was born in 2002, his life already troubled by the time he was welcomed into the world. His parents, Shannon Wilfong and Michael Chikevda, never married and were split up before he was born creating a custody battle that would go on for much of his young life. Things weren't always troubled, of course. At first, the pair shared custody of him, despite the irreconcilable differences that led to their separation. They could both agree on one thing, wanting the very best for their son. This didn't last long, with his father being deployed to Iraq and losing out on precious time with his son. Whenever he was home, he would treasure the time he spent with him, but that time was more limited than he would have liked. This only got worse when Shannon began to disappear with their son when he was supposed to be with him, causing Michael a great deal of pain. Reaching out to authorities prompted a custody battle, one that he won after Shannon never showed up. Granted temporary custody of Richard, it should have been a victory, but that was far from the case. Because Shannon had disappeared, it meant that nobody could bring his son to him, something that alarmed him as time went on. November 2007 came and went, and Michael was quick to report his son and ex as missing. December changed that, as Shannon became a wanted person and was no longer just missing. And, as he had done before, Michael offered as much information as he could to authorities. As time went on, he grew more and more concerned about his son. Offering more tips, he directed authorities to Shannon's mother on a whim. Diane Dobbs was in constant contact with her daughter, and he knew that, hoping that it might point them in the right direction. When her house was searched, they found nothing suspicious, but heard several concerning claims. When questioned, Diane claimed that Michael hadn't treated his son well in a variety of ways, 
causing Shannon to keep him away. Such strong allegations caused a backlash and called Michael's parenting into question. A situation only made worse by claims that he refused to take a lie detector test. Denying the claims, the focus remained on Diane, many wondering if perhaps she was trying to distract them from her. Michael was sure that his son was inside her house and only grew more certain when he saw the covered windows. Always obstructed, it was impossible to see inside of the home. But as time passed by, there were no updates. In interviews, he speaks of the immense distress the situation caused. Unable to sleep and his weight fluctuating due to the stress, his life was anything but peaceful. He devoted himself to finding his son, actively involved in the case until 2009. In 2009, a tip came in. Once again, they were being told to investigate Diane Dobbs's house, and once again, they did so. This search was more thorough than the last, covering every nook and cranny of the house, finally finding something that raised questions. Against one of the walls was a dresser, nothing too suspicious, positioned in a peculiar way. Pulling it away from the wall revealed a hole big enough for a person. And upon closer inspection, they discovered two figures hidden in the darkness. Shannon Wilfong sat in the hole with Richard, finally answering the question so many had. For two years, Shannon had hidden Richard in a tiny room, only allowing him outside at night when there was no chance of him being seen. Still, his freedom was limited. He was never allowed to leave the house, never allowed to seek medical help, and never allowed to see natural light. Shannon claimed she'd hidden him to protect him from his father, but the allegations were dismissed, quickly allowing Michael to gain full custody of his son. After two years of hiding, Richard acted like many children, running around outside the second he was let out of the police car. One of the officers said he acted as though he'd never seen sunlight or the outdoors. But despite his isolation, he was still well-spoken and polite. With court oversight, Michael was finally given his son back. Resilient as ever, the years of captivity didn't seem to have dampened his spirits. And in the years since he was rescued, his spirit only grew. Almost an adult, his father encouraged him to take up sports and supported him as he grew from the lanky and pale boy that had once hidden behind walls. Well-adjusted and with a thriving social life, Michael was finally able to treasure the time he spent with his son once more. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist is going to pop up right now with more videos you'll love. See you guys next time.